The Unshackled Waves, Episode 41. Hello and welcome to the Unshackled Waves podcast. I'm Tim Wilms, here for this week's review episode. I'm once again joined by my co-editor-in-chief of The Unshackled, Sukith Fernando. Welcome again. Thanks, Tim, and hello, everyone. Now, there's been a lot happening this week, but the, the big news is it's finally happened now. Article 50 of the Lisbon Treaty was triggered by British Prime Minister Theresa May, which will formally begin the process of Britain leaving the European Union. Of course, the triggering of Article 50 has triggered the Remainers, who have done everything they can to sabotage the Brexit process. This is a great victory for the British people and democracy, who made the informed decision to to leave the EU nine months ago. Uh, Back here in Australia, there was another blow to free speech this week with Mark Latham being sacked from his shows on Sky News for triggering too many people. Uh, It's strange that he was hired to be triggering by Sky News, but apparently he was not allowed to be that triggering. It is disappointing that Sky News, which is supposed to be a right-leaning network, has caved into the leftist outrage machine, who probably don't even watch Sky. Uh, In the United States, Donald Trump suffered a major political setback last week as Congress failed to repeal and replace Obamacare. The mainstream media, of course, gleefully reported this as uh, Trump, uh, the self-described dealmaker, failing at the first deal he attempted to make in Washington. However, the truth of the matter is that Trump was more likely sabotaged by Paul Ryan and other establishment politicians who wanted to send a message that they are still in charge. Uh, This recent event looks like the Trump revolution now needs to be extended to members of Congress. But we'll start with Article 50 being uh, triggered, and and we'll talk about, uh, well, Sukas, you're our uh, Brexit, almost our Brexit (laughs) correspondent, so you do want to talk about what this triggering actually does. Yeah, so the Article 50 is what actually is what commences the um, actual process of allowing the United Kingdom um, to leave the EU. So just because they voted, um, well, the sad truth is that just because they voted to leave the EU, um, it doesn't mean they automatically can leave. It has to mean that um, the uh, European Union has to sort of start a process um, whereby they can, which will take a few years at most people say, um, to start and actually leave the EU and make it official. Um, And it was signed this week by Theresa May and she actually delivered this very well. I mean, Theresa May has quite um, she's a controversial person because she is a bit of a leftist in many ways. Um, you know, she's actually more left-wing than Hillary Clinton overall. Um, and, you know, she, uh, people weren't really sure that she would actually make things work. You know, when, when she became the prime minister, the new prime minister, people were just asking, you know, will she make it work? Will she ruin it? But it's, it's nice to see that she actually met the target. She said she will do this, trigger the Article 50 by the end of March. And she did that. Um, and that's really nice to see. Um, you know, and hopefully it doesn't take long to actually make the process complete because some people are saying that it might go on until 2022, um, you know, which is quite some time, but let's hope it happens as soon as possible. Yeah, I remember uh, when when the vote happened uh, last year, a lot of people on the right were sceptical with the uh, would the government actually listen to the people? Would they try to yeah. uh, just delay it and then ignore it? Uh, but yeah, you've got to give credit credit to Theresa May. I mean, she she was a a soft Remainer when David Cameron was Prime Minister, but when she came into the job, she said that Brexit means Brexit, and that's what she's done. Yeah, that's really nice to see because you know people, as you said, people were um, not sure if, whether she will actually cave in to you know the, the Bremeners or the Bremoners as they're called, um, and you know because she ultimately she was quite a, 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 she was she was a Remainer. I mean, she wasn't very open about it, but she was a Remainer. But it's nice to see that she said, you know what, the country voted. It's you know it's a democracy, um, and you know we had to give the people what they want. Okay, and that's what she did, and she said she will do it by the end of March. She did that, and the article she signed this week and it has been delivered already to the president of the European um, the, cou- the council um, Donald uh, it was Donald Tusk I think yes. yeah Tusk yeah. When, when, yeah. when I first heard that name it, uh, it was like oh, dude, that's very similar to Donald Trump's yeah it name. is yeah 
Yeah. Um, yeah, that, that's what I was saying, Donald Tusk, you know, it just occurred to me that, you know, it's very similar. But yeah, Don, Donald Tusk is the president and it was delivered to him. He made, um, you know, a, a bit of an emotional tweet, you know, saying, oh yeah, I got it, you know. Um, just, but yeah, it's been, it's happened. Um, let's hope the actual thing gets finalized as soon as possible. Well, the EU, they've already given an indication that they're not going to make the uh, divorce process easy. They yeah. uh, they want uh, the borders to remain open. They do. They do. All throughout, since since Brexit, since the actual vote, throughout um, Europe, all the, many of the members of European Parliament actually, you know, made lots of threats, you know, we won't make it easy for Europe, uh, sorry, for, for Britain, you know, we, we will we will have the upper hand in the negotiations. Um, and that sort of that sort of gave you know that, that sort of revealed to us who they really are, um, but you know they they did make lots of threats um, and they did threat, threaten to actually make sure that this the Brexit actual the actual triggering of Article Fifty won't happen, but it did happen. Um, so you know there may be empty threats, um, but it is quite certain that they will try and make it harder for Britain um, to actually leave the EU. But you know again. Uh, it depends. It depends on the actual, you know, who has the power ultimately. Well, let's talk about some of their delaying tactics because they they've done several uh, court challenges. There was the one that it had to. Um, I get confused. There, there's the Supreme Court, and isn't there the High Court? Or have I got the order mixed up? Yeah. So it was a High Court. It was first. It was a High Court decision um, uh, that said that you know the Parliament should have a vote on this, and then it was a Supreme Court. It was taken by Theresa May, um, and that's where that's where we actually saw that she is very committed to making sure that this process will happen by the end of March. You know, the High Court said no, that pa Parliament has to vote on this, and then Theresa May was like, okay, that's okay. I'm going to take this to Supreme Court, um, and she did, and that and the Supreme Court said that, you know, she lost, it has, it has to be voted on by parliament. And the main person who was leading that um, that revolt um, was a, a woman called Gina Miller. Now she's, you know, she's ethnically not British. Um, and, you know, she uh, she said, uh, you know, I'm gonna, she actually said, I'm going to try and do whatever I can to make sure that, you know, I get what I want. That's what she was saying. She was saying, she was being selfish. I want to I wanna try and make sure I get what I want. That's what she was saying. Um, and she, she was going to try and make delay this even further un, until, you know, way after March, but she couldn't. She was unsuccessful. Um, and the actual Supreme Court decisions um, probably didn't work in the favour of uh, Remainers because, you know, it did pass through Parliament with amendments, but it did pass through Parliament. Um, and the Remainers' last chance to actually stop this was taken down. Well, wasn't there another attempted challenge as well? This was over the uh, European economic area that uh, they argued that there had to be separate legislation for uh, the UK to leave that as yeah. well, but that didn't work. Yes, that was linked with the Supreme Court as well. That was part of the Supreme Court decision. Um, their argument was that since Britain doesn't really have a constitution, a written constitution, their argument was that if I, you know, if, if we were to use, if we were to pretend we had a constitution, then it would be unconstitutional for Britain to actually leave the economic area um, because, you know, the constitution doesn't, well, the constitutional, our idea of the constitution doesn't support that. I mean, that was one thing they did say, and that was one pro possible amendment, you know, yes, we can leave, but we will stay in the same economic area. Um, and that um, actually was very uncomfortable. It was very disturbing for us Brexiteers because, you know, leave, leave means leave, you know, Brexit means Brexit. Um, but they said, no, we might have to say in the economic area because you know our constitution, well, their their idea of the constitution um, would mean that that would be the case. But that didn't work again. Um, you know that didn't turn out to be um, successful, um, which is a good thing. And the remainers they held uh, one last uh, rally on the weekend uh, in London, uh, which was only a few days after the the terrorist attack at West Westminster. Of uh, uh, they didn't. The the leftists they didn't believe that that was insensitive at all. They're saying, "Oh, we're also you know paying tribute to the dead as well." But like, it, it, yeah, it, it was just a tip. Like they've held these rallies so often. They held it when after Trump was inaugurated. Like you lost uh, a democratic <laughs> vote. Get over it. Accept it. You know, don't try and overturn the will of the people. That's not how our society works. 
Exactly. I mean, aren't they? I mean, it's it's weird because they are the ones meant to actually be um, the proponents of democracy. I mean, I would expect more left left wing people to be actually more appreciative of democracy than right wing people. That's what I think. Um, but it's interesting how you know they are actually going against democracy and you know sh- sort of flaunting their hypocrisy by trying to act fascist and uh, authoritarian. Um, but yes, that the protests were always you know carried out um, since the vote. You know we. So millions and millions of people um, after the Brexit vote rallying in London saying that, you know, I'm European, I'm a British, you know, I, you know, I, I didn't vote to leave. So, you know, I, I shouldn't be leaving. Um, well, obviously, the concept of democracy doesn't really make sense to them. Um, but yes, there was one last, uh, the, uh, the ultimate, the, ul- the last um, protest in London outside, uh, outside of Westminster Palace. Um, and, you know, that was just very juxtaposing, you know, that was juxtaposition, that was contrast, because here we are, two days ago, a few days ago, there was a terrorist attack, and then afterwards, they have a vote. I mean, the, it's it's interesting, because we voted to, well, the British, the Brexiteers voted to leave because of things like terrorism, okay, that's exactly why, and it's ironic how, you know, one, one event occurs that justifies Brexit, and then next minute, they start another Remain protest. The left have yep. shown their total disdain for democracy over the past few yeah. years. That's if, yeah. if, if what the people voted for is, in their view, uh, view, bigoted and evil, then it's not allowed to stand because our morally virtuous views are, should be the only ones that count. Yeah, exactly. I mean, as I said, you know, these these days they've become fascist. They've become quasi-fascist, authoritarian, triggered. You know, it's a combination of all of them together, and they've become this unpleasant you know, triggered force trying to ruin every single thing, trying to, you know, ultimately being hypocrites themselves. Um, and that's what we saw during the uh, during the protests. As you said earlier, you know, it's interesting how they had a, a protest a few days after the bombing, oh, sorry, after the, the shooting. And, you know, it just goes to show what they really are. You know, an event occurs that says why they should be supporting Brexit, but then they don't listen to that. They don't, you know, actually consider that. And they end up, you know... Getting on the bandwagon, getting on the leftist bandwagon, and just you know saying, "Oh no, remain. I'm European. I'm a British. Remain." But yeah, they lost. We won. Um, you know, Donald Trump won. You know, your protest in Britain was just futile. Uh, Brexit won even before Donald Trump. So it's tr- it's time to I think unconfuse yourself and maybe try and enter the correct path and maybe try and realize that Brexit is the way instead of you know trying you know instead of virtue signaling your desire to remain. Yeah, and of course the, the British economy hasn't collapsed. In, in fact, it's actually got better. And now Britain is actually free to pursue trade agreements with countries like Australia and other Anglosphere countries. So it's actually opened up more opportunities being free of the, the shackles of the EU. Yeah, exactly. The EU was a very socialist, you know, a socialist protectionist um, uh, imper- imper- yeah. quasi-imperial organisation. Mini globalist. Yeah, mini. It was it was very interesting because they're mini globalist, but then, well, I suppose glo- globalist can be socialist in some ways, but you know, mini globalist, but then in some ways they were corrupt and protectionist as well. So, so you know, they promoted globalism, etc. But then the 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 actual members of European Parliament, they were prepared, they were prepared to pass any law if they got money out of it. If they got vibe out of it. That's what they did. All the big companies they used. Um, all the they they use the corrupt ministers, the ministers and members of <clears throat> of the of the EU to try and get their um, interests, you know, somehow ratified by the, by the, by that parliament. And that's why many of them were supporting Remain because it because Brexit would mean, you know, more competition for them. You know, more economic liberalism would mean more competition for them, and they, they didn't want that. That's why they were for Remain. Um, but yes, Britain. It, their, apocaly- their apocalyptic language, their apocalyptic imagery has, you know, turned out to be false because Britain is doing very well. Now, one argument is that, you know, the, the pound is going down. That's not a bad thing. You know, currency appreciation and currency depreciation are both good and bad in their own ways. You know, doesn't, one isn't better than the other necessarily. So, you know, the currency appreciation isn't a bad thing. You know, that's not a good argument. Um, you know, it's like it's like saying diabetes, you know, or sugar, you know, high sugar, low sugar, they're both bad, doesn't matter what. So just like that, you know, appreciation, depreciation, they're both the same. Um, ultimately, in terms of the principle, it just, you know, in specifics, it's a bit different, you know. Um, 
but you know, it doesn't really mean that there's not much of a difference um, just because your currency appreciates or depreciates. Ultimately, it can both have advantages and disadvantages. Um, and that's, you know, that, that's, that's just my response to their argument. And we saw the FTSE rising. It's in record, you know, it's in record highs right now, the FTSE. Um, Britain's GDP is growing steadily and it's doing much better than what they forecasted. So, you know, Britain is doing very well and, you know, it all happened right after Brexit. So, you know, the, uh, the, all, the facts are on our side. The facts are on our side. And I've also been enjoying uh, Nigel Farage's activity on Facebook, uh, triggering all the all, all the lefties and Remainers. Yeah, yes, I, I saw that too. Actually, it was shared all over. Um, that was nice. That, I think that was nice. You know, just to just to put in their face. You know, we won. So yeah, that's quite nice. So let's move back to Australia now, and obviously. Um, well, federal, federal politics has been quite uh, dull this week, the, although there were two important pieces of legislation that were before the, the parliament. There was the 18C uh, of the Racial Discrimination Act uh, reform that failed to pass the Senate, which was expected. So obviously we're disappointed, but we knew that would happen. Um, at, the, at the time of recording this uh, podcast, I think they are still debating the co uh, company tax cuts. So they've actually been sitting all, all night and all, all morning and now all afternoon. <laughs> yeah, it's taking some time, isn't it, the company tax cuts. You know, we wanted to have it as soon as possible. Yeah, but probably the, the big, big news, uh, or I, I would say the most important news of this week, is Mark Latham being sacked from Sky News. Uh, he is the host, uh, one of the hosts of the, the Outsiders uh, program, which is on Sunday, which is uh, designed to, uh, you know, be a be a voice for the the alt right in Australia and to trigger lefties. Mark Latham always used to open the show saying, "Trigger warning: you've entered a very unsafe space." Uh, <laughs> uh, both of us are members of the Outsiders support group on Facebook, which is very popular. Um, and also Latham, he he was uh, one of the co-hosts on uh, Jones and Co with Alan Jones. But he's been even though he was hired to be triggering, he is now being sacked for being triggering. Uh, this is after a series of comments, and I'll just go through them. Uh, Christina Keneally, who's also a Sky News uh, personality, she uh, threatened to sue Mark Latham because uh, he said that she was a protege of corrupt uh, New former New South Wales Minister Eddie O'Bead, which was of which was actually like uh, obviously I've got to be careful. I don't want Christina Keneally to see me as well. But she got she only got the job because Eddie O'Bead was a power broker at the time and was able to do the numbers for her. Uh, Nathan Reeves, who was the premier before her, said that uh, any person who is elected to replace me will be a puppet of Eddie O'Bead. Yeah, I'm I'm not really sure what Christina Keneally is doing in Sky News because you know I was very surprised when I heard she was actually in in Sky News. A long time ago, um, when she actually did enter the organisation, because I thought she was, you know, a leftist through and through. Why would a leftist like that be in Sky News? Well, they, well, they, they do have some leftists in in Sky News. I mean, Graham Richardson's uh, back with his old program. So, uh, but I'll move on to the other people who triggered. There was uh, ABC presenter and so-called comedian Wendy Harmer. Uh, he, uh, Latham called her a commercial failure and said that uh, she, she only got the job on the ABC because she's a woman with a disability. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and, and so she demanded a, an apology. And then there, was, uh, then there was another comment he made about uh, the uh, Secretary of Prime Minister and Cabinet, Martin Pargus, Parkinson, saying he was obsessed with uh, hiring women to his department. Uh, Latham, I should put it in Latham's language, uh, obsessed with the shape of their genitalia. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and he called it Parkinson's disease, which I thought was funny. I I knew you were, I, 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 I was so unsurprised. I was like, so, I was like, wow, when I heard that. Um, I sort of, it was like the most obvious thing to, out of there, I mean, I saw Martin Parkinson, you know, it, back, in, back, back when it happened, I thought, yep, he must have called him something to do with Parkinson's disease, and here we go. And then he ridiculed the Reserve Bank Governor because he said he wanted to hire more women, and he, he was inspired by his 15-year-old daughter who urged him to do so, and Latham said, oh, well, 
uh, his daughters, you know, she's probably one of the most privileged people uh, in Australia, yet she's complaining about, you know, disadvantages for women. Like, uh, what a joke. <laughs> well, he has a point there. Mm. And then there was the, the one that got the most attention was uh, at uh, Sydney Boys High School, the boys there, they made a video for International Women's Day where they spoke as women and, like, oh, it was the worst video ever. And, and, the, and the, the worst part about it was the feminists didn't even like it. Uh, Clementine Ford, you know, she wrote an article criticising them and, of, of course, Latham ridiculed it. And there was one boy uh, in it, I, I think he was the school captain who he, he he was speaking as a woman and he and he spoke about having sex with a guy and so Latham said oh, it made him sound gay which which it did which it did that is the most obvious thing there is it did sound, make him sound gay <laughs> and of course uh, Sky News they. Uh, they caved into uh, the leftist bullies. I mean, uh, the reaction of politicians, uh, Tanya Plibersek and Bill Shorten of uh, condemned Latham. Well, of course they would. And what, uh, the uh, education, federal education minister, Simon Birmingham, said that Latham was a bully. And so it was on Tuesday uh, afternoon when they sacked uh, Mark Latham, which was very disappointing. Um, and so there's been a petition launched by people in the outsiders support group to get him reinstated. I think it's now over 5,000 people. It's probably more uh, once this podcast is published. But then Sky News, uh, they issued an apology on Thursday night to Christina Keneally and Wendy Harmer uh, apologising for triggering them. Well, they didn't say it like that. But that's basically yeah. what it was. And so people in the outsider support group of, yeah, a, a, a lot of them are uh, threatening to cancel their uh, Foxtel subscriptions. They're not going to watch Sky anymore. They don't even want to watch Andrew Bolt or Paul Murray anymore. Okay. Yeah, I understand why, why because, you know, these are the worst reasons to sack someone like that. He, did, he was, first of all, he was hired for, to be triggering. And second, they, they take back, they go back on their word and say, nope, you're too triggering, goodbye. Um, I think... One of the worst reasons to sack someone. I do want to say I don't agree with some of the things he he said, obviously. But I mean, I would never sack someone like that because I mean, most of it was harmless anyway. I mean, it was a joke. So why would you take it so well, seriously? The, the, the only thing that uh, is is a bit um, which I, which I find a bit off is the attacking the Reserve Bank governor's daughter. Um, because, like, she's not a, a public figure. Like, she didn't make a... Do I, do I think that schoolboy was fair game. What, he was, like, 17, 18, and he put his, like, face on this, like, publicly accessible video. I mean, yeah. you deserve to get the ridicule, especially when you say something yeah. as silly as that. Yeah, exactly. Today's society, that's the problem we face. You know, people go public, and then when someone criticizes them, they go all nuts. You know, they get triggered, you know, nope. Well, you you take the risk by going public. It's, it, it's irresponsible to expect others to um, hold on to their opinions and keep them to themselves, because that's not how it works. Um, and obviously, as, as, as you said, you know, he did sound gay. Um, mm. You know, what else is there to say? He did sound gay. That's what I thought when I first, I saw the video, um, the cringeworthy, you know, I was triggered by the video, video, and you know, I, I, I heard, I heard him say, I was like, wow, sounds good. I was like, you know, but I realized he was talking like a, f a female, but then, you know, I was like, wow, okay. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, when you watch it, it's just like, what, like he chose to say that. I mean, you're, yeah, you're openly inviting yourself up to ridicule, yeah. and and it's probably good for him that he you know, he was subject to ridicule by Latham because, you know, it'll probably learn to toughen him up and not do something stupid exactly. like that when he's a bit older. Exactly, exactly. I mean, he, firstly, he made a very stupid decision to make this kind of video to, you know, to ha actually take part in this video. Secondly, they all sounded gay, just saying, not just him, you know, they all sounded, many, most of them sounded gay, considering what they actually said. Um, and, you know, third, it's, you should toughen up, you know, it's, you shouldn't just, I don't, I don't want to sound sexist, but I, oh, <laughs> I don't want to sound sexist, but I, I just want to say that, you know, he's a male. I don't expect a male to, you know, get, get triggered or anything by listening to something like this, you know, you should toughen up and sort of be ready to, you know, handle ridicule and other opinions. That's how it is. That's what happens when you go into public life. So, you know, 
Yeah, and I don't think Sky News realises what they've done here. I mean, they, they paint themselves as, you know, a right-leaning conservative network, and supposedly they had this show Outsiders, which was designed to push the boundaries, and yet at the first sign of controversy, they've completely caved into, you know, the, the left as bullies, you know, the usual triggered people, and yeah. have completely capitulated... And I, I reckon their ratings will. Oh, if if the people in the the outsider support group follow follow through with um, what they're saying, they're going to lose heaps of viewers, and uh, it's all their own doing. I mean, that uh, once again, it's an example of um, you know just how just how successful the left are at you know shutting down free speech and free debate and opinions they don't agree with. Yeah, we've seen this happening, you know, all the time these days. You know, the left rallying up and trying to prevent others from saying what they want or associating with who they want. Um, if they do associate with who they want, then they ultimately get the get the battering from them. You know, they, they they get they get somehow they lose their reputation, their reputation is ruined, you know, their others their their business, you know, operational associations with other companies or other organizations that's ruined we saw that with the with the Cooper's beer company yeah um, I mean yeah. it's a new example every week but I think exactly. because yeah. Sky News is meant to be a conservative network I mean it's owned by News Corp who owns the Australian which published Bill Leake's cartoon so we would have expected yeah. better and so it's really yeah I think that's why a lot of you know conservatives and right-leaning people are so upset yeah, and for good reason. They are right to be upset because we expect maturity from something like Sky News um, because, you know, it's meant to be right wing. So, you know, we ex expect them to make the good decision, the correct decision, instead of instead of sacking someone for saying something triggering. I mean, that is a stupid, even if he wasn't, even if he wasn't hired for being triggering, you know, he shouldn't have been sacked because it's wrong. It's, it's immoral. It's unethical and it's immoral to do that to someone um, simply because he says something controversial, you know, it's just it, it feels like suicide for them sometimes and it's like they're trying to you know destroy their own organization by sort of not listening to their own viewers and caving into other another group of people who as you said earlier probably don't even watch that channel anyway and i know they've been getting plenty of uh, angry emails and tweets their way because people have been in the in the outsider support group posting what they've been sending in so they they just it seems like they're just throwing them in the garbage and uh, it looks like they'll probably do the same with this petition, no matter how many signatures it gets. Yeah, yeah, and it's. It, I, I just think you know it'll backfire on them ultimately if they don't listen um, to to the people, to their, to their own customers, to their own viewers. I actually think it'll backfire. Um, yeah, and you know I just don't know what else to say because you know free association, free speech. Mm. You know they're meant to be supporting that. Well, there is still one media organisation in Australia which values oh, yes. free speech and triggering yes. people. So, Mark Latham, if you're listening to this podcast, we would love you to come and work for us. We still very much value uh, your work and uh, your opinions. We do. You know, we want triggering people. That's you know, that's our um, mission you know, to trigger people. So, you know. I just hope you can work for us. <laughs> now, now, people are probably wondering why we're put in such a uh, big defence of Latham, and I have also been quite active in the, the Outsider Support Group, uh, you know, putting, putting my opinion there. Um, but how come we didn't defend Milo or uh, Tommy Lauren? Well, there, there's an easy explanation for that, is that Milo, uh, Milo well, he advocated, you know, abu sexually abusing children, or yeah, uh, ha having sex with young young teenagers, I should say. Uh, that, that that's that, that's a beyond the pale thing. I mean, uh, abuse of children should should not be tolerated. Yeah, he said. You know, it's not like he said. You know, it's natural to have a desire or something. Even if he said that, I wouldn't agree with him, obviously. But you know, it's not like he said that. He said. You know, he full on said outright. Um, he was know, advocating okay. for it. Yeah, he was advocating for it. Yeah, and. You know, so th there's a big difference between supporting someone who was, you know, kicked out or sacked for p being, you know, a bit triggering and then being against someone who's, you know, advocating for something like that, a advocating for something some, some like child murder, considering, you know, Tommy Lauren. Yeah, it's like, so, yeah, I've, the, we, we chose not to comment on the Tommy Lauren thing 
on the uh, on the website basically because so many people didn't like what we had to say about Milo. But yeah, Tommy, Tommy Lauren, she 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 didn't just say she was you know pro child murder. She she said that pro, uh, pro life people were hypocrites, which is yeah. even worse. It is, yeah. Um, I was wondering though, however, you know, maybe she was misunderstood. But then I realized, how could someone like her be misunderstood? I mean, she's in her twenties, in her early twenties, and I'm pretty sure she knows the difference between freedom of you know doing what you want with your body and free you know, and you know full on killing another living being. You know, she was she was using the constitutional. definition of freedom well she was using it in a you know in an incorrect way because there's a difference between you know doing what you want with your own body and full on you know, using that argument to kill another child yeah. um so you know that's what you need to understand with in these situations yeah so the unshackled will defend anyone uh, who is triggering to the point that they advocate yeah. harm to children Yeah, yeah, we will defend anyone unless we're, we're, they're advocating actual harm. Yeah, we're, which yeah. which which should be the the limit for everybody. Yeah, exactly. I mean, we won't support someone who's asking for physical harm, will we? We won't support someone who's who wants to harm children, who wants to you know who's promoting who's promoting uh, you know some sort of uh, sexual abuse, for example. We won't support that. I mean, that's common sense. That's that's common sense. That's logic. You know, why would you want to associate yourself with someone who asks for that? Yeah, so we hope we hope that sort of clears up where we stand on on the free speech issue. Yeah. Now let's uh, uh, update everyone on the the latest developments in the Trump administration. So he's had his probably his first major setback because the Obamacare repeal repeal bill uh, effort failed. It didn't even come to a vote in the House. Uh, but the whole process was handled by House Speaker Paul Ryan. Who has never been a fan of Trump? I mean, he's he's all he's during during when uh, Trump was a presidential candidate, he denounced the proposed Muslim ban. Uh, he didn't endorse him until the very last minute, and when the the Access Hollywood tape uh, came out, refused to campaign with him. Uh, so yeah, he's no friend of Trump, uh, which uh, makes it strange why Trump would entrust Ryan with something so important. Ryan managed to. Uh, produce a bill which both uh, Democrats and free markets, Republicans, hate it, and so it was pretty much as Rand Paul said, it was dead on arrival. And yeah, so a lot of us are wondering: Did Paul Ryan uh, do this on purpose? It sure looks like it. You know, it was like that. Because as he said, the evidence points to the fact that he is anti-Trump. You know, we've seen how he wasn't. He didn't want to associate himself with Trump at all. Um, he ditched Trump. He betrayed him. You know, his own, he, the candidate for his own party. He betrayed him. You know, for making some triggering things about you know women, for example. Um, even though he wasn't advocating for any violence. Um, and and then here we are. Trump entrusted Ryan with this particular job, which, as I said, is quite interesting. Um, I personally wouldn't have done that, um, and then it's somehow blundered. You know that the Obamacare repeal bill he, he, ha, he has not gone through, and you know uh, who knows what's going to happen in the in the foreseeable future. Um, so yes, it does. It sure looks like Paul Ryan may have done this, um, you know, purposely. And there was a photo released of them, you know, laughing. Actually, you know, them well, that, that, smiling. That, that, that's an old photo, but it pretty much uh, crystallizes, you know, what what Paul Ryan and the establishment. Um, po politicians are up to. I mean, uh, yeah, Paul Ryan isn't just laughing; he's like jumping up hysterically. Yeah, yeah. The, the photo, there was a photo released, and you know, it just you just sort of captured you know the essence of this situation. I think it 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 did well in telling us you know everything in using just one picture. Um, so yeah, it sure does look like Paul Ryan had a role in intentionally, um, you know, making sure that this bill doesn't get through. Uh, but of course, it's Trump who who cops the blame for the failure. Of course, the mainstream media and his critics are like, "Ha ha, you're supposed to be the deal maker, and look, you failed to make a deal. Like, how embarrassing for you!" And you know, saying what a humiliation uh, this is for him. Yeah, 
this was, um, you know, it was a it was it was a pot of gold for the mainstream media. You know, um, they were waiting for something like this. Um, they they want to criticize Trump. You know, every situation they can. They they're looking for any opportunity to criticize Trump, um, for any small, even the smallest thing. Um, you know, we saw that we saw that with uh, with Melania Trump having a prayer at a rally, for example. So that every situation they want to try and criticize, and you know, wrongfully and unjustly sort of uh, put him in the spotlight um and that's what they are you know that's that just that's just who they are and they've been using this very very well for themselves um saying that you know he's you know he's not a deal maker you know people you voted for a lie or something well you need to understand that trump isn't a dictator um there's a thing called you know to uh, there's a thing called the checks and balances system, um, which, for, which for some reason the mainstream media left out of the actual topic. Um, and you know, he can't just you know tell them to vote this way. They vote according to how they want to. And the establishment politicians, they still have that that establishment, you know, that, that elitist um, or that unjustly elitist aspect about them. Um, so you know. Trump can't really make a deal with the devil, can, can he? Yeah, how do you make a deal with people who are wanting to destroy you? I mean, politics yeah. is a lot different uh, from business. Uh, yeah. And, and Trump is... I, I, people people have said, uh, like, criticism made of, made of him is that, I oh, said he was going to drain the swamp, uh, but he's appointed a whole bunch of establishment people. Has basically had not much choice. I mean, he's new to uh, politics and governance, and so he had to... He had to have a mixture of you know new outsider people and establishment people. I mean that's why he had Reince Priebus as uh, chief of staff and Steve Bannon as chief strategist, so he could sort of have the best of both worlds, uh, so to speak. But obviously, with this uh, f- failed repeal effort, um, I-, I wrote an article this week saying that uh, we need phase two of the the Trump revolution because. The, the Trump revolution of 2016, it was all about getting Trump elected and, of course, overcoming the, uh, his opposition in the primary, making sure that uh, the Republican establishment didn't steal the nomination from him, and, of course, overcoming the, the biased media to, to beat Hillary. But, of course, Congress is still full of establishment uh, Republicans. I mean, they all won their primaries back in 2016, and so I think the next phase needs to be getting rid of those uh, Republic, Republican congressmen who are ca- causing Trump all, all, all these uh, issues. Yeah, we need to replace the car Republicans with actual Republicans, you know, the Republicans we had in America. Um, well, you know, Trump, back, yeah, you knew Trump Republicans. Yeah. Yeah, Trump Republicans. You know, it's interesting. It's, 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 we need to be. I think we need to be careful when we say Trump Republicans because sometimes um, there are lots of Trump supporters. You know, who are a bit left wing in some ways. Um, you know, so that I think you need to be. A, we need. We need to be a bit careful when we say. You know. Uh, Trump people because I have said the same thing in the past as well and then I realized later on that there are some you know they're right wing socially for example but you know in some ways they are quite left wing um so you know we need to have actual republicans you know I'm not you know not just uh, any Trump support about you know, a- actual republicans you know who who will not just help him um, make sure that these laws when it comes to domestic things are passed but who will also make sure that his attempts at bringing back um some sort of conservative isolationist um uh, sort of policy back into america will get passed as well because as you said earlier the established politicians they're very neoconservative they're very um they're part of the neo-imperial you know yeah, american I mean, intervention yeah. um sort of uh, ideology yeah. so you know we need trump people to make sure that his conservative isolationism um is also passed through congress or else you know, neoconservatism will rule will rule America if that doesn't happen. Well, they're still going to hold that Senate uh, inquiry into the supposed uh, Russian hacking and yeah. the, the apparent Russian troll yeah. army. Um, yeah. So, so, so that's a, another way that the Republicans are not helping him. I, I mean, you would sort of think, like, basically looking at this situation rationally, that the Republicans would be grateful that Trump was able to not just win the presidency, but win the House and the Senate. And so they would, you know, want to accommodate uh, his agenda because Trump has demonstrated through what he's been able to do with the executive order that, you know, he wants to implement his promises. But at the moment, he's being frustrated by uh, Republicans in Congress who uh, just want to do their own thing. 
Exactly. That that just tells us what they really are. You know, it says it says that you know it doesn't matter if Trump won. Uh, their their former you know uh, establishment identity is still with them. That's what it says. At first, you know, they were they were quite grateful. You know, they, they were they were clapping, they were standing, they were giving him a standing ovation um, when it came to his policies. But you know, right now, they, they're not really supporting him. Well, as I said, the. Uh, obviously, in 2016, the focus was, was on yeah getting Trump elected, but 2018, when it's just the congressional elections, I mean that's when um, Trump Trump supporters they can get active in the local Republican uh, chapters and really make an effort to make sure that you know there there's decent Republicans who are coming into Congress who are going to be more uh, you know sympathetic and accommodating to his agenda. Yeah, because we need people who actually want Trump to make sure that his policies are put through instead of, you know, people who have a, you know, a, a hidden agenda with ulterior motives, um, you know, because they want to still want to make sure that the establishment legacy, you know, that, that quasi left-wing establishment legacy is still kept. Um, so, you know, we, we do need actual people. We, we need him to, the dra draining the swamp doesn't just include, you know, high positions, but now, you know, it, inc it includes every single position in the entire Congress, um, in, in the Republican side, and that's what draining swamp must mean instead of just you know including the higher levels um because if, he, if that doesn't happen then his policies many of his policies won't get passed yeah, i mean he needs a new uh republican establishment which is uh i, yeah. I know that's uh, probably not the best term to use but yeah he needs to replace the republican organization with you know people who are in tune with this new uh, his new philosophy yeah, exactly. You know, people who are, as I said, people who are the real Republicans, you know, the ones who support uh, what, you know, George George Washington did with his legacy. You know, George Washington, for example, said, you know, America um, should be isolated. He said that America shouldn't get involved with other people, shouldn't have relations with other people, shouldn't, you know, make economic deals with other countries. And that's what Trump's trying to do. And, you know, we need, and that's, the, that's real Republicanism. That's what George Washington wanted. That's his legacy. Um, so, you know, we need people who are the real Republicans who will align themselves with Trump in order to actually make sure that he's, his agenda for America, his, his, what he wants to do with America is somehow realised. And I know that Trump supporters in the media, such as Judge Jeanine Pirro, have said that Paul Ryan should resign, but uh, Paul Ryan would probably be replaced by somebody who's just as bad. And so that's why we need this yeah. uh, second phase of the Trump revolution. And it's also interesting to note that now Trump, uh, sorry, Paul Ryan is behind in his, uh, his own primary contest, so he could even uh, be one of the scalps in 2018. And he only won his uh, primary back in 2016 because Trump endorsed Ryan instead of his opponent, who was more Trump-friendly. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that just shows that people aren't very confident with Paul Ryan anyway, um, because, you know, he is their president and, you know, the president who won. And, you know, here's Paul Ryan saying, not, you know, who's obviously, who's who's almost openly sort of leading this mini revolt against some of his policies, um, telling people not, you know, his policies don't work, you know, we're going we're gonna to do our own thing. And that's going to cost him. And I, I hope it does. You know, I don't want to sound Machiavellian. But I hope it does, um, you know, sort of learn the lesson of, you know, deviating from what the people voted for. Uh, and it was interesting that uh, Trump in the past day uh, tweeted, it's almost if he, he saw my story, um, he said that uh, <laughs> the, uh, the uh, Republican Freedom Caucus and the Dems are both enemies we need to defeat in the 2018 uh, election. So he's obviously thinking uh, the same thing as us. Yeah, exactly. And he's right. He's justified because, you know, the in many ways, the Republicans and Democrats are both one party in many ways um, because you know, it's become corrupted over time. As I said, real Republicans are not like this. Um, so that's why, you know, we, we need to make sure that we get more Trump friendly, real Republicans um, who can make sure things are actually done in America. And hopefully that tweet as well rallies his supporters to to realise that the work's not done here. You know, we uh, we need to you know keep going if we want this revolution to succeed and make sure that Trump can implement. And we know that he wants to implement all the things that he promised the voters. 
Yeah, um, I think it was you know quite clear that you know this isn't the end of it. You know, just because he won, this isn't the this isn't the end of it. There's still more to go. And this example, this um, is one of the best examples there are that you know the the mission isn't accomplished just yet. The battle may have been won, but the actual war isn't really finished yet. So you know, the point is that we need to continue on um, making sure that the right wing revival is somehow brought into fruition somehow. Uh, probably the hardest bit of the, the Trump revolution is going to be the judiciary because they've once again blocked his uh, proposed yeah. travel ban, ban. Yeah. Yeah, that's another part of the establishment um, well, who's trying, who's a big obstacle. That'll have to be phase three. Yeah, that, yeah, that'll be, yeah, that'll be the third phase. <laughs> Well, that's all we've got time for on today's show. So thank you once again, Suka, for being my co-host for today. That's okay. It's my pleasure. And now for those who are viewing the podcast on YouTube, you'll notice that we have a new logo. It now has the web address down the bottom. So this is when people see the logo, they know which website to go to. So I hope it's to your liking. And of course... Yeah, let's hope it, we hope it motivates you into actually visiting the website more and more. Yeah. Also, the usual reminders uh, still apply, so don't forget if you haven't yet to sign up to our email list at theunshackled.net slash subscribe. Also, consider supporting the website. Uh, you can either become a patron on Patreon or donate via PayPal. And of course, don't forget to subscribe to this podcast on SoundCloud, iTunes, Stitcher, TuneIn Radio, or view the video version on YouTube. And of course, don't forget to keep checking theunshackled.net on a regular basis for all the latest news. And thanks once again for listening, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>